Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Frame Talks Ball. Today I am joined by someone who has had a profound impact on why I do what I do and in a sense Sorry. steering my career towards football and broadcasting. Now, if you're someone who would stay up late at night and watch Champions League games in the late 2000s and the early 2010s, then you obviously know who this guy is. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite football presenters, Joe Morrison. Joe, how's it going? One of your favorite. One of your favorites. I mean, there's a few others that come to mind, but okay. I think I'll say you are my favorite. Thank you very much. We can continue. Yes, I'm good now. Thank you very much. Uh, just 30 seconds ago, I was feeling terrible. <laughs> Joe, there's so much that I uh, actually want to talk to you about. Uh, but I want to start with you. How did a career in football and broadcasting and football broadcasting happen for you? By accident. Quite simply, by accident. I... My kind of ambition, if you like, was to be a farmer. That was the top and bottom of it. I went, I used to spend all my holidays at my uncle's farm. It was a hill farm in Scotland, sheep farm. Um, I went to agricultural college, a uh, university in Aberdeen, and studied agriculture, agricultural business management. So it was farming. Um, then when I came out, of university there was a, a bit of a crash around the world this was the early 90s and there wasn't much there wasn't many jobs going certainly in the farming industry and the big thing about agriculture is most farms and and uh farm businesses are handed down father to son well of course my family didn't actually have a farm so it's very difficult to get into the business it's not like a hundred years ago where all you needed was one cow and two chickens you know um so uh, we ended up, my father got actually made redundant and he used his redundancy money to buy what you would call a corner shop. We call it a news agent, um, which, you know, sells newspapers, cigarettes, bars of chocolate, magazines, that kind of thing. And, um, and of course, I didn't, I couldn't get a job. So I, I worked in the news agent shop and a guy used to come in from the BBC. He was a BBC commentator. He used to come in every day and buy his newspapers and his cigarettes a guy called George Bailey, and um, we used to chat every morning about sport, usually about football, but predominantly about football. And um, then one day he said, you know what, you should, uh, you should get involved in this, you should uh, get stuck in. So that's kind of the bridge that got me from farming to, to broadcast. But it was not my intention. It was not my, it was not on my wish list. How how did presenting uh, happen for you? Because I, I I was looking up uh, and doing some research about you, and what Wikipedia said was because of your charismatic aura, you were fast tracked into uh, the presenter's seat. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I was fast tracked through the BBC, and it was a number of reasons. Um, one was uh, I, I came into it later. Because obviously, like I said, I'd been in the news agent, so I hadn't come straight from college. So I had a, had a bit of, how would you call it, Prem, uh, world experience or world awareness. So I wasn't just fresh out of college or fresh out of university. So I think what helped me was in my broadcast at the beginning was basically I had been the audience on the other side for a few years. I had been the person sitting in the pub cheering on my team. I'd been a fan. I'd gone through the highs and, and the lows. I'd uh, watched football at night. I'd gone to games. So I, I'd done the whole thing on the other side, which some of, or the majority of my peers hadn't. They'd come straight from like a journalism college or a broadcast college straight into the industry and had never been through that phase, if you like, of being a fan. Simply simple as that. So, and then you, you throw in luck, um, I had a great boss at the BBC, but he lived a, a distance away. So if there was any ever breaking stories, quite often they were thrown my way to do because I actually lived, you know, centrally in Newcastle. So, and then, you know, all those moments that everyone has in their life and, and in particular their career, you know, you need a bit of luck. So many people say, you know, I made it because I had this, this um, ambition. Well, ambition's not enough or I had this strategy, strategy is not enough. Luck is still a huge part of it. So when someone was sick, I just happened to be there and available. 
And, you know, one of the biggest things in my early career was I worked all of the public holidays because nobody else wanted to. No one else wanted to work Christmas or New Year or Easter or um, bank holidays, as they call them in the UK, you know, public holidays. So to, to if you're talking about going from there to sort of television, it, you put that foundation in very, very quickly, which was a radio foundation. And then you start TV reporting, but you start TV reporting for the very same reasons. Someone's off sick, there's a breaking story, it's a public holiday, whatever the case may be. The right place, um, right time. Right place, right time. And, and that was certainly the case when I became an anchor for the Premier League. It was, I came to Dubai on a mid-season break with Newcastle United, who I was with at the time, working for at the time, the club, um, and met a producer, uh, an executive producer, who said the very next season they were starting English language uh, broadcast of the Premier League in the Middle East, which had never been done before. So, like, yes, right place, right time. Absolutely. I could never say that it was because of Wikipedia might say it's because of charisma, but I would say it's that, that needs to be changed to luck. <laughs> Maybe it's charisma is luck. I don't know. Uh, you know, Joe, one of the things that most intrigued me about you is, and I think it can this can be a good segue into actually talking about Indian football, is how passionate you are about the game here. I want to ask you, what is it about Indian football that's caught your fancy in a way where you always gravitate towards it? Because whether it's on Twitter or elsewhere, I always see you supporting Indian football. What is it about the game here that 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 makes you, uh, you know, want to constantly keep in touch? Um. It's a great question, and it's a question I get asked often. And I think first and foremost, it's um, my my love for Indian football is my love for the players in particular. I don't have a particular affiliation to the national team because it's not my national team. Um, you know, I'm obviously English. I don't have a particular affiliation towards uh, any particular club in India because it's not my club. My club is Newcastle United. So it's not about that, but it's about the players because... I have followed Indian football since uh, when a good 15 years, if not the, the Bob Houghton days. So is that 15 years? Probably more than 15 years. It might yeah, be about more than 17 years. years. Um, and I've seen Indian players in particular, and this is why I say the players are important to me. I've seen them go so, through so many incarnations of the same shit, you know, the same lack of, care, um, lack of respect from the general public, lack of finance, um, lack of support, um, lack of infrastructure. I've seen the same thing from the Bob Houghton days. Nothing's really changed. So, uh, and, and the reason that I'm probably passionate about India more so than anywhere else is because they have the ingredients. And the ingredients are Number one, you need numbers in terms of your supporter base. Well, 1.4 billion, even if you take 1% of 1.4 billion as your supporter base, that's a lot of support. Right. Uh, India, I think, is ranked, is it second or third in the world in terms of number of billionaires in the country? So you've got the money. And then when you factor in that previously mentioned 1.4 billion people, out of that 1.4 billion, there must be as you and I are talking right now, 11 Messies in India. There must be. It's, yeah. just, it's just a sheer, it's a numbers game. That's, yeah. that's all it is. It's just it's a numbers more. game. And India has those numbers, which is why I also flip the coin and say, that's the reason I'm not interested in some Pacific Islands uh, football association or football landscape is a better way of putting it. Why? Because the population at Pacific Island is a couple of hundred thousand um, you take out old people and babies and toddlers out of that couple hundred thousand, you're now down to 150,000. You take out uh, women who um, are uh, of not of, let's say, athletic age. So now you're down to 100 or, uh, or 75,000. And then you take out of it guys that uh, don't care, they're not passionate about the game. Now you're down to 25,000. So you've got to, to get the best 11 players out of a pool of 25,000. And that 25,000 probably don't even care about the sport. So yeah. you see what I'm saying? It's a numbers game. That's why I cannot... I see the potential, I think, Prem, is the, is the answer to your question. 
and it infuriates me that they're not maximizing their potential. You know, you mentioned that nothing much has really changed since the time that you started watching. Can you put a finger on in or in about the 15, 20 years that you know you've uh, kept an eye on Indian football? What, where are we progressing? Where are we regressing? I'm sure there's some good stuff that is happening. Uh, and what are we most deficient in still? Um, progress is probably the marketing and broadcast of it. Because I was involved, like I said, in Indian football years back. And you'd be lucky if you got the Calcutta Derby broadcast, you know, m maybe a few of the games. They went through spells. There were times when DD Sports and stuff like that um, maybe did it for a season. But it was always dipping in and out. There was never any consistency. Now there's a relative consistency that not only the top flight is broadcast every game, but the, the tiers below that are broadcast as well. So that's the positive. The match day experience is getting better. It still could be improved, but it's certainly getting better. Um, you know, and, so the and ISL the, primarily. The ISL primarily, but the I-League as well. Certain clubs are doing a lot better in the I-League. And the reason I say that is because you're starting to see a lot more women and young girls attending football matches, which would never have been the case 20 years ago. And they just wouldn't have felt safe. So um, that's an improvement. Um, the things that um, are going backwards is still youth development. So you go years back and nobody was even looking for talent. No one. It was just it literally, if someone by accident landed in the right place at the right time, it happened. But otherwise, no one was scouting for talent. Now they're scouting for talent. Well, that's progress. But the problem is, once they found that talent, there's no pathway for them. That's the problem. So they are falling off the edge of cliffs because there's not enough competitive action at junior league level. Um, and I'm talking about sort of under 16 levels and above. You might get a bit of state um, action. But there's no real infrastructure in terms of the development of youth. And you need competitive action. You can't just coach kids and expect them to become the next Leo Messi if they're not getting competitive action to put what they're being coached into practice. So um, they're, still, they're still miles behind in terms of youth, youth development. And when I say miles behind, I mean like light years away, galaxies away from where the rest of the world is. And here's the thing, here's the kicker. Every time someone pops their head up from whatever organization, whether it's FDSL, whether it's the AIFF, and says, uh, we're making progress, I keep repeating my reply, which is, so is the rest of the world. You're not progressing fast enough. That's the problem. What's your take? on uh, the current situation obviously you know we didn't do really well uh, well that's an understatement actually to be honest at the asian cup uh, we actually had a pretty good 2023 and i know okay we the three tournaments that we won were uh, relatively less competitive and we've won them before as well with the intercontinental cup the saf cup uh, but we also beat kuwait in the first world cup qualifiers and, uh, you know, it was actually looking extremely promising at the time. I'm, I'm not going to lie as an Indian football fan. But then the showing at the Asian Cup was, was, was extremely forgettable. And then I actually thought that the two games that recently happened against Afghanistan were just what the doctor ordered for India to just start winning again. It was a six-point fixture. It wasn't a three-point fixture. And then I just thought, okay, this, is, this has to be six points in the pocket. And the 2027 Asian Cup gets guaranteed if we reach the third round of the World Cup qualifiers, which we've never done before, by the way, which the, the coach has promised. But now that looks like it's in jeopardy. Uh, where do you see the current situation uh, with uh, the, you know, the recent performances and fans calling for a steam match out? And Chetri probably our best player for several years on the verge of, you know, at the tail end of his career. Uh, where, where do you see the immediate solution, if you like, for Indian football? The solution? <laughs> um, well, first of all, let's quickly go back before we go forward. Um, when people say they weren't happy with the showing at the Asian Cup or, or the, or the um, Afghani games, what are you referring to in particular? In fact, I'll ask you the question first. What are you referring to in particular when you say um, the poor performance at the Asian Cup? So I think that the first. If you had to pick game, out one thing, Prem, what was poor? Just one thing. What was the what was what 
disappointed you the most? I think we underperformed in terms of what we are, we I know we are capable of and fans know what we're capable of. So I'll give you an example. In the first game, so we played Australia first and then Uzbekistan and then Syria. So and it was a it, it was a tough group, mind you. So Australia was the highest ranked team and then Uzbekistan and then Syria. So against Australia, if you if you watch the first half, look, nobody and I think you know all Indian football fans would also agree we didn't expect to get anything out of the Australia game. It would have literally a national holiday would have been declared if we even got a draw in that particular game just because of the difference in quality. We know that, but still excited, big occasion, and we were actually doing pretty well. Uh, obviously, you're not going to uh, play, play play them uh, out of the out of the park. They have they will keep the ball, but defensively we were we we keep, we kept a solid shape and. After that, okay, Australia got a chance. It was always going to happen. They won the game 2-0. But then after that, we thought against Uzbekistan, if this is what we can do against Australia, let's show the same bravery. Let's show the same courage against a lower-ranked team than Australia. Surely we can do better. But we lost that game by four goals to nil. And then against Syria, who were closest to our ranking, who were, I think, 91st at the time, and we were around 99. Now, I think we've dropped like 122, but let's not talk about that. Uh, against Syria, it was it was just a no-show. It was like, it didn't look like a team. It just, the players looked like they, I mean, I, I, all, I never want to, I never like to pull up the players, but it certainly felt like they're not, motivated enough to give their best and that just continued in the two afghanistan games where it just felt like they no you know nobody really they were just playing as an obligation so uh, here's my take on it first of all um what was your expectation and what were what were in general what were the fans expectations of the asian cup now my expectation and i'm being honest here was that they would not get out of the group i didn't think at any point yeah. before neither or during, did I. And I went to all three games that they would get out of the group. But I did have an expectation that they would score goals in some, if not all, of the games. And that's where I was disappointed. So when you say that they didn't perform, my interpretation of not performing at the Asian Cup was they did not score one goal. Not one. Now, go to the Afghan games. Um, same principle applies. My expectation was that they would win one, if not both, of the Afghan games. But my expectation was also that they would score goals. And they didn't. And people are going to watch this and pull me up and say, ah, Chetri got a penalty from the penalty spot. Not no, from no, open no. play. No. no. I'm talking about open play. Because penalties, quite often, not always, but they certainly were in this case, were gifted goals. You know, Amiri's stupid handball, and it really was a ridiculous handball, gifted True. India the opportunity from the penalty spot and credit to Sunil Chetri the penalty still has to be scored penalties are always pressure kicks but they're gifts so again so we are now five games into 2024 and India have not scored a goal so when you say to me um what's the problem there's your problem and uh, why are they not scoring goals well first and foremost um, a coach will live or die on the selection of his first 11. And I'm not sure Stimak has got that correct. In all three games in the Asian Cup, in both the Afghan games, they have carried two players, in my opinion. And you will never win a game if you're carrying two players that aren't contributing to the side, offensively or def defensively. doesn't matter which. Uh, did you want to say who those players were? Yeah. Manvia Singh and Nikhil Pujari. Yeah. You, you don't think they were they, they were good enough or certainly not the informed players well, to be to be picked for the for the well, for the well, occasion. You, you um certainly the Asian Cup, um, and you pointed out about how well India had done in last summer's series. Now, here's the difference. Last summer's series were friendlies. Yeah. Were friendly. Tell me where's the pressure? Where is the pressure? Because look. I worked for Newcastle United. I did 70 years, 17 years of Champions League. But in particular, um, my time at Newcastle United, I saw come through the doors of that club so many talented boys, so many over the years that I was there. But you know what the fundamental difference between those who I could reel off the names and you, you've heard of them and you know who they are, 
and the names that I could reel off to you that you've never heard of and they disappeared into the ether was just mentality under pressure. Whether it's the pressure of performing in a trial, you've got one week to show that you deserve to stay here, two weeks to show that you deserve to stay here, uh, a week to, to show that you deserve to play at this level. Um, a lot of people uh, don't know, but certainly in English football, many, many juniors, many academy players are only given one-year contracts and they get told around about Easter time, around about now, whether they're going to be kept for the following season, season you're going to get another contract. Like, that's pressure. There's, people think that there's a lot of juniors in football get like three-year or four-year or five-year deals like seniors do. It, it just, it's not true. It doesn't happen. So, well, it might happen on the odd occasion when, when a messy comes along, but very rarely uh, does it happen because actually there's FIFA rules as well about the length of contracts for, for uh, youth players. So uh, I digress. Um, it's pressure. Can you handle the pressure? And all of a sudden we saw in the Asian Cup, players that were put under pressure for the very first time. Because obviously there was a lot of younger players who weren't at the last Asian Cup, which was yeah. uh, here in the UAE five years ago. Uh -huh. So as soon as they put under pressure, didn't perform. It's as simple as that. And I would never have them anywhere near the first team squad again uh, because of what I saw in the Asian Cup. Now, there were certain players who didn't perform in the first game against Australia because it was their first high-pressure match. But then they got better as the, as the tournament went on. You know, they become more settled and got into the rhythm and the speed and the tempo of the, of the game. So um, it didn't, you know, they weren't bad players. They're just the occasion got to them a little bit at the beginning. So, yeah. and then you walk from that into Afghan home and away. And again, pressure, you know. Afghanistan are not a better team than India individually or technically. But what they did do, superbly in my opinion, in both legs, is they put India under pressure, rolled the dice and said, let's see what happens. Let's see who can handle the pressure. They, they took a gamble and uh, yeah. India succumbed. They, they knew that they couldn't outplay India, but they could outpressurize India. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Mentally and physically. Make them uncomfortable. Make your opposition uncomfortable, preferably for 90 plus minutes. And they you know, did that. Uh, what you, yeah, what you were just mentioning about, um, about, about you know, uh, very few players actually making it through. I think there's a book, I uh, forget the author's name. It's called uh, No Hunger in Paradise. It's about uh, how there's actually, you know, we hear of the Phil Fordens and the Jude Bellinghams, there, but there's a gazillion players who, who actually don't make it to that level. Yeah, and absolutely for every one of them, every one Phil Foden, there's minimum 10 that don't, um, and, and even more nowadays. And, um, you know, I think hunger and desire comes with a certain personality trait. Uh, and you and I were talking off air before this. It's like, how badly do you want it, you know? And every time I see in the media there's been a fight on the training ground, I'm like, you know, it's a big story. It's a huge story in the media. To me, that used to happen on a regular basis, two or three times a week at Newcastle United. So uh, why? Because you've got a bunch of guys who are desperate to make this position their own, to seal their place in the team, you know, really committed, really committed. Yep. Who are the players that uh, that actually impressed you? I'll tell you, uh, I, I mean, I'll go first, if you don't mind. Anwar Ali, uh, I'm sure you know of Anwar. Um, he is, I think, the future uh, for the for the next 10 years. And I think the the, the combination that we have now at uh, center half with Sandesh Shingan, who's, you know, an experienced veteran now in Indian football, um, and a youngster like Anwar Ali, I actually really like that. In fact, like you mentioned, there, were, there aren't too many players who played in this Asian Cup uh, who were there uh, previously in 2019. It's, it's a relatively young team, but it's also a good mix of uh, youth and experience. So the likes of like Naurem Mahesh and Liston Colasso and Sahal, uh, Anwar, Apuya. Uh, Apuya is also, I think, one of, the, one of the very few players in Indian football whose touch is actually... Can I say it? Can I say it? I'm just going to say it. Whose touch is actually like a footballer should be. <laughs> mm. Okay. 
Um, and and that's you know one 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 uh, place that I really think that we are extremely poor at. We'd at least be scoring. We definitely would have scored at the Asian Cup. Our first touch always lets us down. And if our first touch lets us down, then I mean you're not going to make any progress on the pitch, right? But anyway, coming. Uh, I mean, give me your two cents on that. But also tell me who are the players that that yeah, you like watching. So uh, there's two players that stood out for me at the Asian Cup, if you're referring to the Asian Cup. Uh, there's two players that stood out for me, and one of them has stood out for me for years. And I still bang my head off the wall wondering why, 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 why is this guy not automatic starter in every single game? And, and we're only referring to international level here, by the way. I'm not talking about Indian Super League or whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah. And that is, so, and that is uh, Tapper. Um, and the and the reason I talk about Annie Tapper is because I have now seen him in so many international games where the team has been on the back foot and not playing well. And as an outlet, he's the only guy on the ball who can take it and play it under pressure or hold it under pressure. The only one. And you talk about Apuya. Apuya didn't live up to his billing in the Asian Cup, in my opinion. Was he bad? He no. Didn't. No, he, didn't. no, yeah, he, wasn't he bad. didn't. No, he, he, no, he wasn't bad at all, um, Apuya. But he wasn't the level that he was in Indian football. So that's the case with all players, right? Because the level of uh, the, the quality of football that they're playing in the ISL and the, the when you face the likes of Australia, you spoke about the pressure and just the level. Uh, it's, it's it's just well, it's difficult to contend. The, the, the thing is, the level is not that great in Indian football. Plus, as well, you have alongside you foreigners who are well-schooled. Yeah. They might not be the best foreigners in the world, but they're certainly well-schooled and they're very, very capable okay. of doing the basics right. So some of these players can hide when a game sort of maybe goes against you as on the, or you're on the back foot. Now, the other player was Deepak Tangri, who really, really impressed me. And especially in the game against Australia. Especially in the game against Australia. You couldn't get a bigger, tougher game to make your debut in, and he didn't sink. And I thought he would sink. You know, when I saw him named on the team sheet, I was like, ooh, wow, this is a big call. And he just held his own. There was an instant where he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the Australian players. I think it was Irvin. Was it Irvin? Um, but basically just said to him, like, um, I, I, could, I can't read lips, Prem, but it sounded to me like he was saying to the, the Aussie player, go fuck yourself. For a, for a young boy making his debut, that's exactly what I want to see. Because what it tells me is, number one, he's mentally tough. Number two, the occasion hasn't got to him. Number three, he isn't giving undue respect to players, and in particular the one individual that he, that he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with, or the team that are ranked above him. There's no doubt that player is better than Deepak Tangri. There's no doubt that Australia is better than India. But he didn't, he didn't care about that. For those 90 minutes, I don't care who you are, what you are, what your name is, how good you are. It's like it's you and me here right now. Let's go. And, you know, as, as we would say in England, let's go in the car park right now and sort this out. You know, it was literally that kind of thing. So those were the two that impressed me. And I saw it in 2019 when when Tapa was dropped for the final game against Bahrain. They could not alleviate pressure, and it was just a matter of time before Bahrain got the goal. And then they saw it again in Syria game. Could not alleviate pressure. Didn't start Tapper, couldn't alleviate pressure. Didn't have anyone in midfield that can control the midfield or control the ball under pressure. And guess what happened? The game that, as you pointed out, maybe they should have done better, and I think they should have done better against Syria um, in comparison to the other two games, they, they failed. I don't understand that. I literally don't understand that. And more think, so, uh, more so yeah. if you think that Tapper is an offensive and creative player, yes, I get that. But Sahal has been carrying injury. So, like, you know, if you say, look, it's either Sahal or it's Tapper, I, I can get that argument. I understand why someone would have that debate. But one of them was injured, was carrying injury. So now it's not a debate. He's got to start. Now, I was just talking to uh, uh, a Mohan Bagan fan uh, the other day, and he was actually telling me that one of the reasons that Thapa is probably 
you know, not first choice, certainly wasn't in recent times, is because he's not having a great domestic season. That's probably so. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm honestly, uh, I disagree with you a little bit. I don't necessarily, even uh, in the second game against Afghanistan, I, I didn't really see what, what the hype has been actually about Thapa and like you said about Apuya, he's not lived up to the billing. I actually he think he didn't, he didn't, with Thapa. He didn't start the second game in Afghanistan. He came yeah, on. He, he came on. He came on in the second half. Right. So I'll tell you now that unless you're one of the elite players in the world to come on in a game where you're on the back foot, irrespective of the scoreline, to come on in a game where you're under pressure but against on the back Afghanistan, foot, Joe. Yes, but you. But you're coming on in a game where you're on the back foot as a substitute. You're basically being told to rescue the game. That's what you're being told. And I don't think that's his role. I think his role should be to start the game, to get control, to allow those in front of him to actually get a front foot and to get a positive start in this match, rather than all of a sudden, shit, we're chasing it. Mm. Uh, you know... There's a player in the I League called Ladrin Zuala Lalbeknia. Yeah, he's a boy from Mizoram, plays for Azol. And he just very recently broke Sunil Chetri's record of uh, the highest number of goals scored in a singular I League season uh, by an Indian. He That's scored. Cool. Yeah, uh, so Chetri and uh, Mohammed Rafi had the record of 14 goals in 23 appearances and this guy's already got 15 and 18 games so surely will score more if he continues at this rate i think there's a couple of games still to go uh, for as all and there's this conversation that's going on as well uh, joe right about uh, the, the the departure of sunil chetri whenever it happens who are we putting in that number nine position well you mentioned manveer singh manveer singh where's the number nine but like you said because uh, you know, for example, he's been playing for Mohan Bagan, and there's uh, Petratos, and there's Cummins, so both foreigners. So Manvi's not gotten a chance through the center, and nobody in the ISL, no Indian in the ISL, is playing through the center. La when I look at the likes of Lalvin Zuala, uh, even Vikram Pratap, who was actually picked for the national team because of his exploits with Mumbai City FC this season, he's the top Indian goal scorer in the ISL with seven goals in 18 games. Uh, who, who do you think is is going to uh, replace J3 and wh where do you see this going? Do you really think that we... I mean, obviously, nobody's got to be the next Sunil Chetri. You can be the first Lalrin Zuala, of course. But you you understand what I'm saying, right? We need somebody to score the goals as it is. <laughs> We're facing a dry patch. Without Sunil Chetri, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, look, um, out of due respect, uh, congratulations to Zuala for breaking Chetri's I-League record. Uh, first of all, Chetri scored that when I-League was the top flight in the top division, you know, so you're not comparing apples with apples, number one. Number two is it doesn't excite me, doesn't bother me, doesn't get me out of my seat. Why? Because he scored one more than Chetri did when the I-League is not the top flight and there's just a few games left. Now, if he'd banged in 30, 40 goals this season, that would make me sit up and take That's notes. an outrageous wow. number. It's an outrageous number. Um, and as well, it tells me that this guy should not be playing at this level, i.e. in the I-League, because that's just too many goals for that level. He should be immediately uh, uh, pumped up a level to the ISL. And if he's still banging in 20, 30 goals in the ISL, then that's when you start to say, this guy's got to leave the country. It's as simple as that. And to put it in perspective, Messi was playing under 11s at nine years old. He was playing under 13s at 10 and 11 years old. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. and this is organized football I'm talking about, not just on the street. So anyone who's any good should immediately be being pushed through the ranks, pushed up through the ranks. Now, coming back to your question about uh, about Manvia Singh, what are we doing now? Making excuses for him? Because he plays out wide. He, you know, if he was playing through the center, you telling me, would you put your entire net worth on Manvia Singh scoring uh, how many goals has Vikram got this season did you say seven seven right so if you played Manvia through the center for Mohan Bagan do you think you would get double figures and would you put your house on it would you put your entire net worth on it no right so that's not your future is it 
Yeah. But he's he's simply not the replacement for Sunil Chetri. So, you know, talent is talent. It'll it'll always rise to the top, irrespective of the infrastructure, irrespective of the politics and all of the nonsense that you and I are talking about and that exists in Indian football. It, like, talented players find a way. So what's the answer? I really don't know. What I do know is anyone that has any glimmer of being the next son of treachery, and in particular as a teenager, has to get the fuck out of India. I don't know how many times I've been saying this, month after month, year after year, every time this conversation comes up. Yeah, that's what I feel about Anwar as well. I think if if he has to, uh, if he has to really make it big in football, I think he's he's got to go out. I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure how that's going to happen, but yeah, I mean, you know, what I see in a lot of the Indian players at national team level is I see they all have one tool. You know, they all have one particular aspect of the game, um, uh, quite competent in one particular aspect of the game, but just the one. Yeah, they're not well-rounded players. If they have the physicality, they won't have the technique and vice versa. Correct. They'll be deficient in other aspects. Yeah, correct. I've noticed Absolutely. That as well. And, you know, that's why I rave about Tapa. Um, because defensively and offensively, yeah, he has both of those things in his locker. Is he athletic? No, I think there's more athletic players than Tapa. Um, you know, he certainly isn't going to go up and down the wing like, like Ashik would or... Uh, you know, Mahesh or, or one of those players. Of course he's not. But um, those Ashik can only go forward and provide the crosses and be offensive when the team's going forward. What happens when the team's going backwards? You know, he can run backwards, but he's not really putting in, he's, he's not positioning himself defensively because he doesn't have that defensive awareness. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um the, the answer to your original question, who's going to replace Sunil Chetri, is I do not see anyone at the moment who can replace Sunil Chetri. There's no one that's on my radar that I would say is like, oh, yes, they've got a chance. Now, is there someone that might have a chance but can't play through the middle because of the foreigners? Possibly. But I think there's a lot of people riding too much on that. So it's become a little bit of an excuse. If only they were in the centre. You know, they'd be scoring just as many goals as the foreigners. Really? You think they'll be banging in goals like Roy Krishna or somebody like that? Really? Tell me who. Tell me who you think that if they were playing centrally, they'd be getting as many goals and as many opportunities, not just goals, but opportunities as Roy Krishna. And I'm just using Roy as an example. Yeah, it's just, it's about the experience, right, Joe? I mean, uh, I wouldn't expect Vikram Pratap to, or even say a Manveer Singh, who's, I think, 28, 29 now, but say a youngster like uh, Zuala, for example, if he starts playing through the centre, I wouldn't expect 15 goals from him, from him in the first season. But the hope is that he can be groomed into a top-notch number nine over the next two, nah. three, four, five years. Nah. I, I, the coaches that I've spent time in the company of and, and chatted to over the years say you can take a talent and whatever level that talent is, you can raise it by a couple of levels. But that's about it. You will never take a talent, um, uh, to come back to Manvir, and I'm not picking on Manvir, uh, but to come back to Manvir, you could never take but Manvir, are. but I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you could never take Manvia and put him into the Real Madrid uh, coaching setup and the Real Madrid setup, and all of a sudden, within um, let's give him a, let's give him enough time, let's give him at least a year. Uh, within a year, he could be playing for Real Madrid. <laughs> never in a million years. And there's the best, some of the best coaches in Europe are the, at that club. And I've just picked Real Madrid as a as, as, a, as a team. Could be any that could player. actually happen if he go if he had gone there, say at twelve, right? No. No. You think the, do you think the quality would show? He, he, he wouldn't if he went there at twelve. He wouldn't survive to fourteen. Like the, the, there's there's basic things in the game. So correct. You know, I, I agree that you that you cannot teach. Yeah. The, 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 there's there's a fabulous debate, and I only had it once, and it was about three years ago. And it's basically this: Would Leo Messi have won what Leo Messi won, in particular the World Cup and the Champions League and all the Ballon d'Ors? Ballon d'Ors is, is irrelevant, actually. I take that back. It's a, it's a gimmick. 
it's a subjective thing rather than objective thing. But anyway, would Leo Messi have won everything that he won in the game if he'd stayed in Argentina his entire career? Isn't that a great question? I don't think he would have. Because even uh, the kind of talent that he is, he needed Barcelona to give him that platform, right? Well, so then the, the supplementary question that comes on the back of it is, how much of it is it down to the talent and how much of it is it down to the coaching? I think it's an amalgamation of both. I'm, I'm not just talking about uh, coaching per se, but I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I mean, with all due respect to all the coaches who ever worked with Messi, I'm not entirely sure how and the Guardiolas of this world I, I, I love and I respect. But uh, I, how, what, the, he, this guy's a this guy's a generational talent, right? So how much are you going to? He's, what he's, are you gonna he's a phenomenon. And yeah, but here's the thing. Here's my opinion on Messi. But he needs the eyeballs. He needs. He still needs to be put on that pitch, uh, in front of a hundred thousand people for him to shine, right? Which he probably I, wouldn't get in Argentina. What I think, no, no. I mean, uh, Messi could do what Messi does in front of three people watching. Um, no, definitely not. But here's the thing with Messi. Um, what coaches bring is they bring discipline. That's what they bring. And it can be personal discipline. It can be positional discipline on the pitch. It can be discipline in the formation that you're going to play today because we just need to get the draw, the point. You know, we can't have you, Leo, running around um, in this free role because of the, the, the type of opposition that you're up against. So it's discipline. That's what they bring. But a coach could never take a player in India and make them top, top player. They have to have something basic to begin with. And then you can say, right, okay, how do we improve this player without a question of a doubt? And, and improving a player is not just coaching discipline, but it's also being surrounded by the right environment, which is why I keep saying get them out of India, because the environment is too, what's the word? Soft is the word I would use. It's not competitive and intensive enough. Yeah. And now it's, uh, you know, slightly comfortable as well, right? Uh, with uh, the ISL coming in, players are making enough money so i think that no no no, no 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 let's let let's stop that right there that, that that's become the that's become the stick with which to beat the players after the miserable performances against afghanistan home and away no the indian players rep respectively are i think in the main and because we're talking about all players here you know everyone just looks at one or two big names and what they're paid and not the entire spectrum of players. Um, so when you're talking about players that are on crawl, there's a lot of players who are not on crawl. So my point is this, in terms of their level in the world and all the rest of it, I think they're underpaid, still underpaid. Yeah, but I'm saying that if they go abroad, there, there might be that fear that they'd probably not even make as much as they're making in India. And then there's that fear of failing, right? Ah. So I'm just saying that there's, there's a, there's a uh, no, no, a, you, no, they, no, let they me could stop get there. into that bubble, right? You, Prem, you make a, a very good point, but with you, you make the correct point, but with the wrong parameters. So people say to me, like, they won't go abroad because they'll get half of what they get paid in India. And I say, okay, so uh, what are they getting paid in India and how old are they? And then the examples that come back are players that are in their mid 20s, 25, 26, 30, whatever. Um, who are going to go to Europe, and yes, they would get half what they get paid in India because they've got to prove themselves. But if you went at 18 or 17 or 16 out of the country, you're going to get paid comparable with India and probably more. It would yeah. depend on country and it would depend on tax, but it would be comparable. So don't come to me with this. If they went outside of India, they would get paid less. No, no. What they might do is to initially establish themselves, they might get paid less. But when a coach comes along and goes, wow, this is the Indian Messi, do you think they're going to keep him on a five-year contract for 30 lakh? It's some third division team in Europe. If he's really that good, he'll bounce up the rankings of contracts and therefore remuneration within one, two, three years maximum. Yeah. No, so at 18, 18, I, I, I agree. At 18, 18, it's a different ballgame altogether. I meant more like, you know, what Jingan did a couple of seasons ago. Uh, I, I meant like that sort of thing where you've already kind of had a few 
playing years under your belt here in India, and then now you're trying to, uh, you know, try your luck abroad. I, I was actually uh, speaking of that sort of a scenario. No, it, it, no, yeah, and, and I totally understand where you're coming from because many of the fans come from the same angle, and it's an it's an actual incorrect angle. And what my point to you is um, that, that what you just said moments ago is exactly what's wrong with it, which is the amount of times I see written in the media or I hear come out the mouths of fans in India is they want to try their luck. What do you mean try your luck? You know, I can, I, I got lucky in my career. It should be a strategy. It should be not try your luck. It's like, we're going to go and do this. We're going to go at the earliest stage you possibly can and we're going to do it. It's not like, you know, oh, well, like the amount of players that come to me when they're 28, 29 years old and say, you know, can you help me move to Europe? I'm like, it's over. It's finished. If you come to me at 19, you've got a chance. You understand? Don't yeah. just don't just do it because you've now put money in the bank and it comes back to the comfort levels again. You're too comfortable because you'll get to Europe. You'll find out it's really difficult and you'll go home because you realize that, um, you know, it, you don't have the hunger for it. Yeah. You're not willing to fight for it. Would be, and uh, and, I, and I'll yeah. give you a, a prime example. There are players who've gone from uh, the Middle East, in particular, um, Saudi, UAE, um, Qatar, to Europe, and they've lasted two weeks and come home. Not because they were bad players, but simply because they've got off the private jet. You know, um, they get given Ferraris and villas when they win Kings Cups, Presidents Cups. Um, win the league here in the Middle East. And then all of a sudden, it's lashing with rain. It's seven degrees centigrade in Northern England. And someone is trying to kick you left, right and center. They don't want it. They don't want to stay. Get straight back on the plane after two or three days and go home again. Yeah. If you were serious, you'd go like, I don't care about the money, the Ferraris, all the rest of it. I want to stay. I want to fight for this. It comes down to what we were discussing earlier, right? The mentality. Desire. You said that that's the differentiating factor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe, coming back to your career, uh, and I'll, I'll end this in the next five minutes. I know you're a little pressed for time. Tell me the best moment of your career. I mean, you've 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 been in some some really enviable rooms, right? You've gotten you've spent some time with um, Sir Bobby Robson, Alan Shearer. Uh, I'd love to say Sunil Chetri as well. And according to Wikipedia, you also got an interview with Pele. Is that correct? Yeah, that was it. St. James's Park. Yeah. I wouldn't say that was the best moment of my career. Um, that's a really tough question because there are so many. Okay, I mean, give, give me a top three. Top three. Okay. Um, in no order, by the way. So I, yeah. I literally couldn't put one as third, one is second, one is first. Um, uh, so one would be the first World Cup show, uh, FIFA World Cup show I did in 2014 um, because uh, obviously I wasn't selected to do the World Cup initially um, and uh, Gaurav Kapoor was and Gaurav is a nice guy, I've got no doubt, but he's uh, renowned for his cricketing understanding and prowess. So to then get called in like parachuted in, as the saying goes. And I was served as well, half an hour before the first show, I was served with a $5 million lawsuit for going to the opposition, for working for the opposition. And I produced that night myself. I That was one of my best performances because of you know the things that we've been talking about. It just focused my mind. It was like, I was absolutely determined to, you know, really stick two fingers up um, at at uh, at the lawyers and um, you know at ten sports and or, and those who obviously deemed me not good enough to do the World Cup uh, just three days beforehand before all the nonsense began. So that is a highlight. But for, can you understand why it's for a very different reason? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a highlight because um, they actually gave me the option on the night and said, look, you know, if we were served with a $5 million lawsuit half an hour before going on air, um, we can understand if you don't want to do this show. And I was like, absolute opposite. No way at all we're doing this. So that's one, but for a very different reason. Um, the what, happened, Calcutta, what happened regarding the lawsuit? <laughs> uh, they lost. I won. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
that, that the rest of the rest of it is non-disclosure, but they lost and I won. That's all you need to know. Um, <laughs> so that's one. Um, the second would be the Classico pitch side at the Classico. Um, it was in the final season that Messi was at Barcelona. So it and kind of like, Facebook. Yes, correct. This was the La Liga Facebook joint venture. Um, and, and it was groundbreaking as well. I mean, you know, tech companies have got their fingers all over uh, sports rights at the moment. It's a, big, it's a big topic of discussion right now around the world, various sports, not just football. So it was, uh, it was a fabulous experience, not just doing it, but also, you know, getting involved with a tech giant and understanding how they operate and, you know, the way the world's going because you just have to hold your hands up and go, hey, you know, they know a lot about what's going on in the world and the way the future looks in terms of, uh, distribution of broadcast and distribution of, of sport so that's uh, that was definitely one and and i think the other thing as well was seeing messi in his final classical and in, in final season kind of bookended my la liga experience because i started la liga a year after pep guardiola took the reins at barcelona so i came through that entire like you know um, the golden years, those four years, obviously I only did three of the four years, 2008 to 2012, um, were just spectacular, absolutely spectacular. Um, and then I would say uh, probably so, the... So just to chime in, Joe, there, uh, I'm, I'm the biggest Fernando Torres fan you'll ever meet. So when you say, you, you know, those those were four golden years, did you were you there at the ground when Torres scored at the Camp Nou for Chelsea? No. In the champion. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. You were presenting it in the studio. How can I forget? You were yeah, presenting yeah. it with Sunil Chetri and Carlton Palmer. Yeah. And you yeah, asked Sunil correct. Chetri if Torres was worth 50 million. And Chetri said, yes, he is. And Carlton was like, I don't think he's worth 50 million. But okay, anyway, he's repaid it Goodness for Chelsea me. by scoring tonight. <laughs> How do you remember that? Um, yeah, so, so that was, you know, pitch side. And then the other one I would probably put in there is the Calcutta derby. So in no particular order. Um, just because it was before they revamped the stadium and, and put the seats in and reduced the capacity to whatever it is now, 60,000. So it was still the 100,000 plus mark. It was East Bengal, Mon Began. It was bonkers. It was the entire trip was an experience because I hadn't been to India that many times at that point. This so, was 10 action days, was it? 10 sports, correct, 10 action yeah. days. Yeah, correct. Um, and... Yeah, and the production was just crazy. It was a bamboo platform that was built 100 feet above the pitch, sticking out. It wasn't level. It had a slope on it. We had uh, these chairs. You know, there was this fear that you'd fall off it and fall 100 feet to the pitch. Um, uh, one of the fans threw a piece of concrete at, we think, Carlton. Um, <laughs> but it didn't hit him, unfortunately. I wish it had. Um, so, yeah, there was just so many things that, that happened on the night that made it a crazy, crazy night. I, I remember actually sitting with Carlton um, once we finally came off air. I think it was that game. Once we finally came off air, I think we were still sitting having a beer at like 5 a.m. thinking, what the hell just happened? You know? Are, are you still in touch with the guys? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I love how that that show panned out because I I don't even think that you would have expected it and you know any interviews that I've seen of yours here in India and and elsewhere as well uh, it's it's been what like ten years on since C two K and but it's just people used to just look forward to it man just so, watching that camaraderie between the three of you yeah so um, what I don't think we and in particular my executive producer Jason get enough credit for is a large majority, some of it was luck, but a large majority of that, 75% of that was very deliberate. You know, we were very specific about a couple of things, which I'll tell you now. One was presenter must be in the middle. And the reason the presenter must be in the middle was it, it, it generated a physical dynamic of the guy on the left, the, the ex-pundit on the, ex-player pundit on the left and the pundit on the right crossing over you and being very um, argumentative. That was very specific, and we thought that through for a long time. We tried out different sets, and we settled on that. Then it was picking the two guys, two guys that could genuinely be argumentative, um, and Budgie and, and Carlton were that. They weren't putting it on. It wasn't hand up. They would, gen they would argue in the green room before. 
They would argue after we went off air. But we, we all loved each other. There wasn't hatred there. And then the other element was, I don't know if you remember, we brought Twitter into the format. Oh, the yeah, show. I remember. With, with the WAGS was, section as well, right? There was WAGS, a... yeah, all the rest of it. Um, and that was in 2012. And it shocks me to this day. And, and those tweets, by the way, were live. They weren't curated. They weren't made up. Um, it was genuine people tweeting into the show as we were live. And what it did was it provided a connection with the audience, which even now, they, they, certainly in Indian sports television or certainly in Indian football television, there's absolutely no connection with the audience. They still talk at the audience than talk with the audience. Um, and so those were, were a few key elements that were planned and deliberate and not accidental and they they i think they were the fuel that fired that c2k show for those years i yeah, I, I don't share, i mean you tell me prem you're on the ground there you know more than me you're the one who who watches indian football television nowadays um i don't hear the noise of people staying up late and watching pre-shows and half-time shows. There isn't. There isn't. Um, I think there you go. most people, including myself, uh, would just would tune in for the games most of the time. Whereas with, uh, like back in the day, it was, it was as much excitement for uh, the argument, the banter, the repartee <laughs> between uh, the three of you, mostly the two of them, uh, <laughs> as it was, you know, with the game. So it was well, actually I'll, a lot I'll let you into a little secret. Um, yeah. It got to a point whereby their butting heads was so intense and so good. Like literally butting heads, the bald literally, heads. Literally, <laughs> literally butting heads. It was so good and so powerful and so strong that what was happening was we were all meeting in the green room, as you do, before a show, an hour before the show. And the whole thing would just ignite because obviously it had got legs and it got some momentum and we could re we realize that people absolutely loved this. But what was happening was um, we realized that the two guys were what I would call gassing out before we got live on air. They'd had their raging debate in the green room. So we ended up having to separate them and keep them apart before they went on air so that all of that energy went actually onto the set rather than just got left in the green room. And we actually had a, a saying, save it for the show, save it for the show. So as soon as someone started arguing, I started saying something, the third person would say, save it for the show, save it for the show. And it became like a mantra, you know? Yeah. I mean, if there is to be an argument, then might as well make some money off of it, right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and you know what? I am so proud that I see one or two shows nowadays doing the same thing. You know, people are talking about uh, CBS Galazzo, you know, Kate Abdo, Mika Richards, Thierry Henry. I don't know if you've seen the clips on social yeah, media. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. The ingredients are exactly the same. Exactly the same. You tell me Mika Richards' career. What's he famous for? But he's a fabulously colorful character. A fabulously yeah. energized. That's, what favor. That's why I think he's on the podcast with Gary Neville, uh, with uh, Gary Lineker as well, rest, the rest is football. Absolutely. And, and he carries them. And now Budgie is an energizer. Carlton's an energizer in different ways, but they're energizers. Um, Jamie Carragher brings nothing to the show. You go and put Jamie Carragher, when you see Monday Night Football and Jamie Carragher, sorry, Gary Neville is a week off or he's away doing something else. And you have Jamie Carragher with the third person. That is a show that you just don't watch. It's as simple as that. Um, so picking your characters and making sure you've got chemistry is so, so important. And even to this day, myself and my executive producer, Jason, we still keep in regular contact and we still discuss, would you believe, after 10 years of not working together, we still discuss intense detail about how and why something works as a format. It might not just be football. It might be any other sport or another show. Um, so we, we still analyze now like how that works, why that works, if it works, if it doesn't work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed by... I'm obsessed by on-screen on -screen chemistry and the dynamic of it. Awesome. Uh, Joe, just this one final section that I want to end with. Um, it's like a game that I want to play with you. It's called Overrated, Underrated. And there's like five <laughs> names I've got here. Uh, just tell me if you feel they're overrated, underrated, or properly rated. Fair game if they're properly rated, according to you. Uh, the first one is well, you know, before we start, you know, I can't say properly rated because then that's just not good TV, is it? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I'm learning a thing or two already. <laughs> Erling Haaland. Um, oh, he's not hit the standards oh, oh. of last season for sure. I mean, I'm, just, I'm not just talking about uh, you know the stinker that he had against Arsenal and what Roy Keane said about him <laughs> looking like a League Two player sometimes. I don't think he's that, but uh, I think his overall I, gameplay is not. I'd, I'd any day pick somebody like an Mbappe or even a Harry Kane over him because of the all-round game and yeah, performance. I, I, I agree, and but the, but the thing is, he only cost them fifty million, so. Maybe is your word. Can we change it to overvalued or undervalued? Yeah, sure. But the the, the rest of the names aren't all players. So. <laughs> all right, right, okay. Uh, I mean, look, he, he's massively undervalued at fifty million to, for the amount of goals that he's delivered. But he's definitely overrated. He doesn't. He's one of those. It's about um, athleticism and power, and mm. that doesn't always win you matches, and it doesn't always deliver you that number of goals season after season after season after season. So you see him like being like a having a, the sort of career that, say, as Zlatan Ibrahimovic did, where, you know, he scored a lot of goals, obviously, but uh, limited ability. A lot of a lot of the times, uh, I, I felt like Zlatan went missing in the big games, which is probably why he doesn't have a Champions League. Yeah, possibly. That's not a bad comparison. Possibly. Second one, Saudi Pro League. Uh, underrated. You think and I'll tell you why. There? And I'll tell you why, because um, I'm of the older generation whereby you follow your club, no ifs or buts about it, through thick and thin. But the younger generation, all they care about is the stars and the players. So mm. if the Saudi Pro League can continue their momentum to bring the world's top talent, the fans will follow. It's like, how many times have you seen a NASA shirt anywhere in the world outside of Saudi Arabia since Ronaldo arrived? You know, Beckham, when he went to Japan, all of a sudden, like, you know, they're Beckham, sorry, not Beckham, uh, Michael Owen, when he went to Japan, they are um, um, Michael Owen fans. Uh, Beckham, when he went to Real Madrid, all of a sudden, they're Real Madrid fans. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like modern fans now, they follow the player, they don't follow the club. So what Saudi's doing is saying, oh, hold on a second. We don't need to build legacy clubs we just need to get the best players. And what will happen over time is those players will not be, you know, hitting 30 or, well, there's actually quite a few of them that are certainly younger than 30. Look at Jota. Jota is one of the best young players in Europe at the moment, or was, you know, when he was at Celtic. And, um, like, everyone wanted his signature, and then he ends up going to Saudi. So they've got the money to do it, and they've got the ambition. This something similar happened with the Chinese Super League, right? Where there was such hype and hoopla around it for a few years. They invested, they pumped in so much money, and uh, nothing really came out of it. I mean, the Oscars and uh, a few of the other big name players went there. But here we are, where we're talking. Probably, I mean, Saudi probably has more money. Number one, I, I, I think. Well, look, China had a lot of money as well, but I think um, the end game is different because Saudi hmm. are going to get the World Cup. There's no ifs or buts about that. So now you've got 10 years to build that foundation, whereas China, there was no end game. What's the end game? You know, they were talking about maybe he's applying for the World Cup in 2050. That's too far away. So there wasn't really a kind of a purpose to it, I don't think. Enough of a purpose to it. Yeah. And there's a joke going on uh, with, Ronaldo, with Ronaldo fans saying that Saudi are the real winners of the 2022 World Cup because they beat the champions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the new Champions League format. Um, I don't know. I'd like to see it for a season first, but I think it's a sticking plaster to, you know, to the war, and it is a war. Um, it's gone. It's on, under the surface, but the war that's now going on in global football to um, to control the game, basically. So you've got the Super League that hasn't gone away, still bubbling in the background. Yeah. No matter what Infantino says, and don't listen to anything he says because he's full of shit. Um, he wants um, he wants a bigger slice of the club pie. That's what he's after, and he is trying to create his own version of a Super League. Now, at the moment, it looks like it's going to be a one-month World Cup type tournament with all of the best teams in the world. You know, the best teams from Boca, River Plate, all the way to Real Madrid, Barca, Man United, Liverpool, etc. And I think it's a it's a great idea. Um, 
but have no doubt that it's a power play. And that's why UEFA have been forced into this position to change their format. But you know what? As you and I both know, Prem, if they don't sort those kickoff times in India, you're never going to grow the UEFA game in India. I still, to this day, don't understand why there's not uh, double kickoff times for every single match round, equal split for every single match day. I don't understand. It. Yeah, and well, because at the moment it's still highly. If there's uh, uh, how many games are there each night? Is it ten games? Is it each night? Each night, yeah. Is it ten fixtures or eight fixtures in the Champions League? Each match day. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think there's there's ten. Yeah, I think so. I think there's ten, and they're doing like two games with an early kickoff, and the other mm -hmm. eight, or if it's eight games, six, two games with the early kickoff, and six with the late kickoff. I don't understand why it's not four and four or five and five. I can't remember how many it is. So uh, as far as the the competition, yes, it looks like there's going to be more jeopardy, but you know, mm, not sure. Okay, uh, Indian football. <laughs> Uh, massively underrated. Actually, Indian football or Indian football players? Uh, Indian football as, as as an ecosystem. Uh, underrated. I don't fully understand that question, but underrated. Oh, yeah. yeah. Undervalued. Okay. Undervalued. Yeah. How um, about Indian football players? Huge, huge potential. Um, Indian football players overrated. Hmm. Wow, that's a that that's a really interesting one. Indian football underrated. A lot of potential um, is still to be scratched, but Indian football players overrated. Uh, like that. Yeah, like we, we can only talk about players that are actually on the Indian football landscape at the moment. We can't we can't talk about some kid that might be playing in an academy right now as we speak that's twelve years old and could go on to be an absolute world beater. We can only talk about those that are, you know, front and center. And, and I'm sorry, but they're, you know, from what I saw in the Asian Cup, forget about the Afghan home and away, but the Asian Cup, not good enough for Asian level, not good enough for Asian level, not world level, Asian level. Yeah, 100%. The Asian Cup is actually our World Cup for now. People keep talking about when India will get to the World Cup. You've got to focus on getting into the top eight of Asia first and foremost. That's the first. And India are think. currently what, 17 in Asia or 19 in Asia? Yeah, 17th or 19th, yeah. And we, so you're, you're uh, no, nowhere near the nowhere nowhere near the best, no question. Mm -hmm. And the last one, Newcastle United. I just purposely put it in there because <laughs> well, I know you're a Newcastle fan. Underrated, always underrated. Newcastle United. Yeah, done. They did well last season. Uh, they got into the Champions League. What after twenty years? Uh, since the, la the yeah. last time that actually uh, Newcastle uh, qualified for the Champions League, you might have been working for them. Is that correct? My last year, yeah. That was mm. the last time they were in the Champions League was my last year at Newcastle United. If someone had said to me back then... 2002. Yeah, uh, no, it was... 2001, two, yeah. That's, that's the last, was the last, the last time they were in the Champions League. 2005, yeah. Um, if someone had said to me back then, I think it was 2005, or was it 2000? I can't remember whether it was the 4 5 season or the 5 6 season, but anyway, um, if someone had said to me back then, Newcastle won't be in the Champions League for another 20 years, I would have gone like, you, You're talking nonsense. Yeah. Weird, eh? Weird what happens in football. Yeah. All right, Joe, uh, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for your time. I think uh, I've taken too much of it. I'm very sorry about that, but and and, and, and you know, uh, like you said before we uh, went to, before we started this, uh, you could go on and on all night. It's my turn to say that now. It's just been so much fun talking to you, and I hope that we can do this again. And uh, whenever you're in Mumbai next, I hope that uh, we can catch up for a cup of coffee. How often do you come, by the way? Oh, I can come two or three times in a very short space of time, and then not come for you know best part for of the what? Years. Um, everything. Sometimes it's it's to go see games. Sometimes it's work. Um, yeah, it's it, it's both. It's both. All right, it just okay. depends. It just depends. So you know, it's like I love it. I miss it. Um, I love the energy. You know, it's um, at the end of the day, it's all about energy, and I love the energy. So um, yeah, it's good. I mean, look. Prem, what you're doing here and all of you content creators is absolutely superb and you have to keep going. And I know that 
Um, sometimes motivation comes from the top and when the national team's not doing very well and there's not a buzz around football at a, a national level or a state level or a club level or a league level, that sometimes you can get a bit disheartened. But, you know, it doesn't rain forever, as the saying goes. Right. Thank you so much, Joe. Pleasure. My pleasure.